The tomb where soldiers watched in vain Was borrowed for three days His body there would not remain Our God has robbed the grave Our God has robbed the Welcome to First Baptist Church of Elkin, a community of faith that seeks to love, live, grow, and go like Jesus. Regardless of who you are or where you've been, everyone is welcome, really. If this is your first time with us, we feel honored that you would choose to worship here today. In the pew rack in front of you, you'll find a visitor card. If you're interested in connecting with us and learning more about our church, then please fill out a card and place it in the offering plate when it comes by later in the service. You can also scan the QR code in the right-hand corner of the screen or on the back of your bulletin and fill this out online. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome to our Facebook viewers. Though we wish that you could be with us, we're so thankful that you could join us online. If this is your first time viewing the service, then please let us know in the comment section below. Here are a few things that you need to know this week. Graduation is just around the corner and we will celebrate our graduates in worship on June the 2nd. Anyone graduating this spring is invited to participate. If you would like to recognize a graduate in our June edition of the Herald, then please submit the student's name, 
family relation, and graduating institution to Lance at fbcelkin at gmail.com. Mother's Day is coming up on May the 12th, and it's time to beautify our campus again with geraniums. If you'd like to donate a geranium for $10 in memory or in honor of your mother or another loved one, then please see Lance in the church office. Voce will be holding their spring concert, Like a River in My Soul, on Monday the 29th at Highland Park in Mount Airy at 7 p.m., and then again at FBC Elkin on May the 6th with guest musician Summit Strings. Church conference is this Wednesday in the chapel at 6.30 p.m. Please make plans to join us as we celebrate what God is doing through our teams and committees. There will be no adult Bible study or youth group on Wednesday, but our preschool and elementary areas will meet. If you have an announcement that needs to be shared in next week's Need to Know, then please email me by Tuesday of this week. God bless and welcome to worship. Good morning. morning. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray together. Gracious and loving God, we open our hearts and our minds to you this morning as we enter into this time of worship. We've gathered as brothers and sisters to give you praise, to repent of our sins, to be reminded of forgiveness, and to go forth equipped to live changed lives. We desire to be your disciples, Lord Jesus, those who would follow you faithfully and bear good fruit in your name. We long to be people who are patient and kind. We want to be filled with joy and peace. 
And we want to be people who are known for our gentleness and self-control. And we know that developing these qualities is not always easy. Life can easily lead us to grow distant and bitter. We can indulge our desires with a lack of self-control. It's easier to hate than to love. So we ask for your forgiveness, Lord, for not always following you faithfully. You are the vine, the source of our strength and goodness. So we rely on you to help us and grow us into people who look more like Jesus. Be with us now and always. In Christ's name, amen. Please join me in the responsive reading. We are branches rooted in the vine of Christ. We come because we seek to abide in Christ. The branches that remain in the vine bear much fruit. We come because we long to be spiritually vibrant, alive, and erected. If we abide in Christ, then Christ's words will abide in us. We come because we strive to be faithful disciples. We gather for worship now to the glory of the one God. Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, may we your wildly to God tends us Amen. Amen. Please stand now if you're able and join us in our call to worship Him 229 and kids can come down for kids' time. Good to see you guys again. Look what I found. A stick, stump, yeah. Can you guess what I'm gonna do with it? Break it? No. Right, no, not that hungry. Um, any, <laughs> any other guesses? What I might do with this stick? Throw it. throw it. I could throw it. Yes. Somebody with it? Not going to do that either. Um, so <laughs> I am going to take this stick home because I'm, it's spring and I'm going to plant it and water it and grow a tree. tree. I'm wondering oh. what kind of tree this might grow into. Oh. Oak, possibly. Um, how long do you guys think it will take for it to grow into a tree? Like 11... Long time? Weeks. Do you want to hold it and see if you think it can pass it down? 
thousand years? How about never? I don't think it will grow into a tree. Why won't it, if I were to take it home and try to plant it, why do you think it won't grow into a tree? No seed. And, and what? Yeah, there's no seed on it. No, yes. Trees aren't vegetables. Yeah. So, well, we have saved me some trouble today. I don't have to, you know, try to plant a tree that will never grow at home. So, um, in today's scripture, guys, this is the thing that Jesus is um, teaching today in the scripture about how branches are connected to trees or vines and that we are all like those branches and he is the, he is like the tree or the vine. Um, and that when vine, when branches are connected, you know, to their trees, they bear fruit, right? They grow and um, they, but to do that, to grow, those branches have to do what? What if they're... Yep, they have to stay connected to the tree. What if they're cut off from the tree? What happens? Um, they die. For sure, yeah. So, um, so the branch wouldn't be able to receive water or food from the tree if it's cut off and the branch will die. And if the, um, so then it's, it's not bearing fruit. And one of the reasons Jesus is talking about trees and branches and fruit is because he wants us to think about that, how we, again, are like those branches and he's like the tree. And remember that when we stay connected to him, then like those branches on a tree, we are much better able to receive um, good things and then share those good things, right? So um, we receive God's love, his healing, um, and his forgiveness. And, but Jesus is also reminding us that um, we can become disconnected or separated from him. Um, and unlike this, um, that stick there, you know, if we ever do become disconnected from Jesus, it's okay, we can reconnect to him, right? And so uh, that's a good kind of mental picture for you guys to remember. Just stay connected. Jesus is divine. He is like the tree and we're like his branches. Um, so we want to be able to share those gifts, right? Share love and share forgiveness um, to other people. So that's our good news today, okay? Let's pray. And then I have something after we pray for you guys to take with you. Dear God, thank you for Jesus who invites us to connect with him and receive your gifts so that we can then share those gifts with others. Amen. You guys come up here. I have fruit stickers for you to take with you. And so you can be reminded to be like fruit. And there's all kinds of, so just grab, I think you can maybe, I know there's, you want to see what they all are. Dragon fruit. You know, there's tangerine. Does that look good? You want a banana? <coughs> banana. There you go, Slate. Oop. Thank you, guys. <laughs> He's trying to sneak the stick one behind his back. <laughs> Lisa, now join us in our hymn of praise, How Deep the Father's Love for Us.
bow your heads with me in prayer. Eternal God, we gather on this, the fifth Sunday of Easter, to lift our voices in prayer, trusting that, that you listen eagerly to both our concerns and also our many aspirations. We thank you, Lord, for the energy and the hope of Easter. And help us to acknowledge always the power of your resurrection, which enables us to step out in faith to serve you with courage and faithfulness. Help us to remember, Lord, that you came forth from the tomb, not just to rescue us, but to empower us to be light in a dark world. A people called not just to celebrate that the stone was rolled away, but to also roll away stones for others who are hungry for truth, and for confidence and stability. May Easter tide also rise up within us the desire to embrace the challenges in our world. And Lord, we know that there are many. We pray for those today who are experiencing a physical and spiritual hunger, many of them in our midst, in our community, and I ask that we would be moved to do our part to meet these needs. We pray, Lord, for peace in the world, especially in the Middle East, and for the wisdom of world leaders. We pray for all who protest that they may do so peacefully, and that if anyone has the audacity to protest anything at any time, we ask that, that we would always have clarity regarding the nature of our protest and the implications of our protest. Lord, as your church, we are called to protest sin and violence, and the best way to do that is through faithful living. Our passage for this morning calls us to trust in you, for you are the true vine who enables us to bear fruit in our coming and in our going. We are called to trust any pruning that you wish to do in each of our lives and in our church so that we can grow toward the light of your love and bear the very fruits of your kingdom. Lord, today as we worship you, we know that there are many who are struggling to celebrate the hope of Easter because of the darkness that surrounds them and us. So we pray for all who are sick. We pray for those who are taking tr cancer treatments these days. We pray for folks like my uncle who is waiting for a, a life-saving heart transplant, others who face the despair of newly diagnosed illnesses, and some who are enduring lifelong conditions. For each of these, we pray for healing. And we pray for your miraculous presence. May they all be able to live and grow in the light of your love, despite the struggles and challenges they face. Lord, today's text is all about us growing together as your church, connected to the one true vine who is Christ our Lord. So let us pray together as one church the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.
Will you please pray with me? Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for leading us here to your green pastures and quiet waters. Thank you for giving us this church where we can come and be restored. As we are restored, we ask that your goodness and love will give us more generous hearts. May we give back to you so others can experience the green pastures and quiet waters. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the 15th chapter of John, Jesus the true vine. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. 
Abide in me and I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. These words are a gift from God. There are a lot of abides in that text, aren't there? A word that we don't really use that often, do we? Although growing up, it's a word that I knew very well. I can't tell you how many times my mother said, as long as you live under my roof, you're going to abide by my rules. Does that sound familiar to anyone else? You know, at the time, all that stuff sounded kind of legalistic, but as I grew older, I appreciated that I was raised with that kind of structure. And then when I went away, left home, realized that I was still expected to abide by the rules of the household that was far away, but it's a little more difficult when you are confronted with the realities of human freedom. Our passage for the morning, Jesus is wrapping up what uh, we refer to in the Gospel of John as... His farewell discourse, and up until this point in the narrative, the disciples have been able to spend most of their time with Jesus. They've eaten together, and uh, they've slept together out under the stars, and they've, they've moved together from, from place to place as itinerant uh, ministers, if you will. But the timing of this text is really what makes it, makes it I think, so, so significant. Jesus will soon be going away, and he offers this farewell speech for the disciples and for us as the church. It is a farewell speech that is loaded with both promise, but also loaded with expectation. Jesus promises in this speech that the Holy Spirit is going to come. It will serve as their advocate, as their comforter. Jesus issues the expectation that they love one another. We'll talk a lot more about that next week. We're going to spend uh, two weeks. The lectionary gives us two weeks in this this chapter. And then offering us this, this call and summoning us to love Uh, one another. We get this beautiful vineyard imagery in today's text where the vine is their life source. It is the the promised life source for the disciples that will enable them to bear fruit in the days that are to come. I am the vine and you, each one of you, you are the branches. And this is where we begin today. Scholar Caroline Lewis says that this is the only I am statement that is accompanied with a you are statement. Uh, I am the vine. And then this Jesus tells us what, what we are. Now Jesus makes several uh, I am statements in this, in this gospel. And one of those, and one of the most important ones, is I am the way in John 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. As most of you know, by the time we get to Acts, the disciples will be known as these peculiar people who are the followers of the way. We in the church today, we are the followers of the way. We make up this living family of God. In this text, we might say we make up this this ecosystem whereby we're all intertangled and and connected together, yet uh, ultimately rooted in the vine of Christ. So Christ the vine is our life source, we might say. God is the vine dresser, which means that God does all of the pruning. God does all of the cutting off of the branches that aren't producing any fruit. And that's a good thing, too, because I don't think any of us are capable judges to truly judge the nature of God's vineyard. If you go sit on my mother's porch sometime, you will discover what I'm talking about. If you're sitting with her on her front porch and she looks to the southeast corner of her yard and her eye catches this place where this flowering, beautiful cherry tree used to be, she will say something to the effect of, well, you know, several years ago there was this beautiful tree over there, but, but Mark Sr. and Mark Jr., that's me, 
They trimmed it at the wrong time of year and it died and the bugs got it and it goes on and on. That was about 20 years ago and she still hasn't forgotten it. Anyone else have a story about pruning like that? We're all horrified to prune things sometimes, aren't we? You've got be, you to be careful. You work so hard for these things, these, these living plants and trees to live. And if we mess up, then all is lost. Sometimes, I think, we are impatient with people. We don't give people the time to develop, which means that we're not capable of being the judges that God is. God knows what's best. God knows how to, how to prune human beings and churches and, and communities. God always knows the hearts of others better than we do. So it's best, and I'll begin here, for us to let God do the work of holy shearing, that God keep the pruning shears and that we focus on what it is that we have been called to do which is to bear fruit. Because some of you can look at a plant the wrong way and it'll die. It's true. Some of you, you've told me, you are a plant's worst enemy. But even if we aren't called to prune the world of good and bad branches, we do have some, some pretty good gardeners in this place. And regardless of how good you are in the garden, all of you know how much work is involved in producing any kind of a harvest. And we know that the blessings of fruit don't come without the power and the sustenance of God, without the irrigation and the sunshine and the power that only God can bring. So today's imagery is really all about our life source that has to work pretty hard on us sometime to keep us all moving in the right direction. Has to work pretty hard to keep the church moving in the right direction. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Much like the sheep and shepherd imagery that we focused on in last week's passage, today's metaphor was one that was very popular among Jewish communities. The vine dresser was often an image for God, and the vineyard an image for the people of God. As most of you know, the chosen people were called to abide by God's law, and they often failed miserably. Uh, they often exchanged their obedience for idolatry and for greed and for mistreatment of their neighbors and basically a desire to build their own empire as opposed to living into uh, the, uh, the, the goodness of who God created them to be. As such, the people of Judah and Israel experienced judgment. They experienced an eventual collapse and ultimately the loss of their corporate witness. You may recall in the fifth chapter of Isaiah where God cared for the vineyard as the vine dresser, but the result was nothing more than worthless grapes. So Jesus' audience knew a few things about vineyards that didn't bear intended fruit. And this is the biblical, this is the cultural context from which today's passage comes. Jesus says, I am the vine, and each of you, you are the branches. I want to invite you to use your sacred imaginations for a moment. Just imagine a vineyard. What comes to mind? the vine branches that are just weighed down with clusters of beautiful and colorful grapes. Perhaps when we think about abiding in Christ, this is the kind of image that comes to mind. We find ourselves sitting out atop one of our beautiful ridges, looking out over a vineyard somewhere in the Yadkin Valley, a 68-degree day, few clouds in September. We really are blessed with some beautiful scenery around here. Abide in me and I will give you anything that you wish, Jesus says. This is how this theme of abiding seems to ring with us. And sometimes life is just like that. All is well. We are abiding in God and God is abiding in us. But you know, this abiding stuff doesn't always feel like a cool breeze in a beautiful vineyard. Because life comes to us and calls us to abide in all kinds of seasons. What did the psalmist write? That we are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in due season, and their leaves do not wither. But some seasons in life don't seem very fruitful at all, yet to abide in Christ is to live into our identity as children of God, no matter what kind of season we find ourselves in. So what does it mean for us to abide? Well, of course, the simplest definition is to simply Obey the rules. Whatever the rules are, you abide by them. Like abiding by mama's rules as children. And abiding in the church and in Christ does come with some rules and expectations. 
You see, Jesus made our marching orders very clear as the church, as it pertained to loving God and loving our uh, neighbors and even loving enemies and welcoming strangers and taking up our cross, doing all the things that we are called to do as disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. But a deeper meaning of abide is, is to endure. It is to reside. It is to be anchored in and to be rooted in. I think Eugene Peterson's translation in the message is, is a really good one. He writes, Live in me and make your home in me just as I do in you. No matter what season of life comes your way, reside in me, stay rooted in who I am. Sometimes abiding is tough, isn't it? One of my uh, late mentors, Mr. Wade Tucker, Reverend Wade Tucker used to say, sit deep in the saddle, partner. You're in for a bumpy ride. And I've kept that with me through these years as a pastor because there have been times when I've known that I was just going to have to sit deep in the saddle. But this is what it means to abide in Christ because that's when abiding is the most important in those barren and bumpy seasons of life. You see, in the early church, the followers of the way, they were looked upon as a strange people. They encountered a lot more adversity than we encounter as the church in our own day. These people were different as they lived their lives devoted to neighborly love and one another, proclaiming the kingdom of God, which looked nothing like uh, what so many thought was the greatest kingdom that they had ever known in the Roman Empire. And they modeled love of God and neighborly love even when it was, even when it was difficult even when it was costly, because they were followers of the way, because they were connected to the vine, they were connected to the life source, and their branches kept growing all over Europe and even here today, which is how we got here, followers of the way. Somehow we moved from, from asking the, the question, is he or she a follower of the way? And instead we say, well, where does he go to church? And we have no idea what that means anymore. But what if we started talking like the early Christians did? What if we began to identify ourselves as followers of the radical, loving way of Jesus our Lord? Now, I think the local church is certainly one of the things that identifies us as followers of the way. You know, Jesus was very religious. He spent a tremendous amount of time studying the Hebrew Scriptures and engaged in prayer and frequenting uh, the temple. But... While Jesus was devoted to religious disciplines, Jesus spends a whole lot of time in this gospel refuting those who would use their religion as a means to keep people down as opposed to a hand to lift people up, because that isn't God's way. As we all know today, we're living in a world where religious customs are often completely disconnected from the way and the path of Jesus our Lord. We're witnessing the marriage of political identities and cultural identities and religious identities. They all merge, and what we discover is, is a people and movements and, and churches and communities of faith that are disconnected from the life source, which is the true vine. And because of that, we often fail to yield any fruit. And I think the vine imagery helps us see how this happens. Just imagine a vine... What do vines do? They wrap around anything they can wrap around themselves around. The post, the intended wire, vines wrap themselves around one another. Every morning when you wake up, you roll over. If you're like me, you pick up your phone. And all of a sudden, you're on Facebook. First thing in the morning, you're tangled up with the whole world. All these vines... Some of them fruit producing, some of them dead as they can be, some of them really in need of pruning. And then you go in the kitchen and you turn on your favorite news channel and you get a little bit of news, mainly propaganda, tangled up in the vines. And then you go to the grocery store and you're tangled up in the vines again with whomever you encounter. And in your head is whatever you heard on Sirius XM radio on the way there. You see, if we human beings are the branches, and we are, then we were all, all of us were created in the image of God. And we're just tangled up in this big vineyard together. 
Some of us bearing fruit. Some of us growing towards bearing fruit. Some of us are not. And I think that's why we need the church where followers of the way come together to be reminded of what it means to walk in the way and in the light of Jesus, lest we contribute to the toxicity in our world. But how do, we abide, how do we abide in Christ? We do so by remembering who the true vine is. The man from Galilee who taught us how to live and love one another in this world, who taught us that our citizenship is not of this world, And we have to remember that we are forever getting tangled up with branches that can absolutely suck the life out of us. The old preachers used to talk about being in the world and not of the world. It's still a good word, isn't it? We're in the vineyard, tangled up with all kinds of people who were created in the image of God, but who are not growing towards the light And you know, growing towards the light really is the goal of the Christian life. I had to look this up. I knew there was a scientific word for it, and I didn't do particularly well in biology, so someone can tell me how to pronounce this, but heliotropism is the the million-dollar term for plants that grow towards the light. When I was deployed last year, our commanding officer sent myself and our uh, psychologist and a chief to southern Spain, to Rhoda, a beautiful place, and it was uh, in the springtime, and I have never seen such beautiful fields of sunflowers, just not exaggerating, hundreds of acres of sunflowers in full bloom. It was absolutely gorgeous. But the fascinating thing was, is when we would leave out in the morning, is they would be facing this way, and then they would just kind of move as the day went along, really, toward the sun. Some of you have grown sunflowers, and you know that's how... That's how they work. They're, they're always facing and moving and, and tracking the sun. It's, it's fascinating. If you've ever seen a, a tree that's on the edge maybe of a cow pasture, it's going to reach toward the sun and it's going to grow that way and it will pursue the sun so zealously that it'll even fall over. We've seen that happen before. But you see, that's how zealous that we should be as followers of the way all tangled up in this messy world, working and being drawn toward the light. It's not always easy, is it? Sometimes abiding in Christ is not a beautiful afternoon at the vineyard. Sometimes abiding in Christ is nothing more than a battle against the powers and principalities of darkness that confront us every day. Sometimes abiding in Christ is a battle against all of the temptations and triggers that confront us in this world and keep us from being our best selves. So abiding is not a warm and cozy image, no more than the sheep and shepherd imagery was in last week's passage. Abiding is really all about growing toward the light and remaining rooted in the vine. It's about endurance, it's about persistence, and it's not always easy. You know, once I felt as though I needed to, my training from seminary, you have to choose a passage when you look at this text. And you either need to, in this text, you need to preach about abiding or you need to focus on this pruning nature of God. And as I read this text this week, and I've often done that, I I came to realize that these two themes actually belong together because you cannot abide in Christ unless you subject yourself to the pruning that God does We learn in this text that God is the vine dresser who prunes the vine. And why is that? It's because sometimes pruning, getting some things out of our way, removing some things from our life, is the only way for us to be drawn towards the light. Sometimes God has to remove some vines. Sometimes God has to remove some obstacles out of our way so that we can be drawn to the light. Like a refiner's fire, God is always working on us and picking us up from this place and putting us over there in another place so that we would be drawn to the light. It's a part of taking up our cross, meaning that we lay down our lives. This, this is subjecting ourselves to the pruning of God that allows this heliotropism to take place. And the most difficult aspect of this passage is that sometimes God even prunes the good branches. God even prunes the fruitful branches. It's tough, isn't it, when God messes with the good things that are happening in our lives. Lord, I'll let you do whatever you want to do with the stuff that didn't go well. 
But then God starts messing with all the good stuff. Life has taught me that even though it may hurt when we experience this holy pruning, God always knows what's best for our lives. Now, I'm not talking about blaming all of the bad things that happen in the world and all of the human suffering on the backs of our good and loving God. I'm convinced that the chaos that was in Genesis that God came to bring order and speak order into is still here. And I don't know why good things happen to bad people and I wouldn't for a minute begin to say that God causes things like that to happen. But I do think that God will mess with us when our lives are going well. You know, I left a really good church to come here and be your pastor. And I still miss playing golf with those folks. I miss fishing with those boys and I miss Miss Margaret Hardy who just passed away a few weeks ago. I miss her chocolate pound cakes as much as I like your pound cakes. But I know without a shadow of a doubt that I am right where I am supposed to be. I imagine as you look at your lives, you can think of some examples as well. I love my little piece of dirt over on Douglas Road and my beautiful, young, growing family, but God picked me up, sat me in a Middle Eastern metropolis, and I was just miserable. I'm miserable in any metropolis. But I found myself to be just miserable. But you know, by the time I left, I had discovered the beauty of a new culture, the beauty of the people who were there, and God had enabled me to grow as a husband and a father and as a leader. You know, God takes those holy shears... And we don't like them. But God takes those holy shears and cuts and whacks at our lives in ways that we may not always understand. And sometimes it's difficult. But you see what God is doing is enabling us to grow toward the light. God will change your job and your zip code and your friends and your office. And God will even change your mind about some things. This is the pruning that God does. You know, the church is probably the most obvious living organism where we witness the pruning of God all throughout our lives. Everything was going so good, preacher, until you brought that up. I've heard that a few times in the last 20 years. We were going along just fine until them their deacons started dreaming about how we could better engage the community. Everything was going just fine. But God pulled out the shears. And sometimes God's pruning work will even send folks to other churches. And you're not allowed to say that out loud, but let me ask a question. How many of you came to this church today from another church? Over half of you did. Yeah, maybe even three-fourths of you. I'm glad that you don't go there anymore because you wouldn't be here. It's tough, isn't it? To subject ourselves and our spiritual communities to the honest and transparent shears of a God who shapes us to be who God is calling us to be for such a time as this. Christ is the vine, and we are the branches, all of us in the Christian community, connected to the vine, growing into places where God can best utilize our witness. And if you are abiding with Jesus, then you are destined to be pruned and to bear fruit as you grow towards the light. And you will bear fruit, the psalmist says. You'll bear fruit in due season. So let me ask you today as I bring this sermon to a close. Are you growing toward the light? And what areas of your life do you need to pray that God will enable you to extend and grow toward the light of God? Is your family growing towards the light? Or do you feel as though you're standing still? Is your mission team, a number of you are part of the mission team, is your mission team beginning to get a little stagnant? Are you getting comfortable Or are you growing towards the light? Is your connect group growing toward the light of the future? Or do you find yourself sometimes living in the comfortable shadow of the past? Is your marriage being enhanced by the light of Christ? Or is it tangled up in conflict because you're not rooted in the light of who God is in Jesus Christ? Are you growing? 
Or are you stuck? Are you in need of the pruning of God? And are you resisting the God who prunes us, who promises that our best days can be before us? There's an old saying that I got a chuckle out of, and you probably will too, that many of the church people who think standing on the promises are actually just sitting on the premises. <laughs> but abiding in Christ is active participation in the life of the church and the beloved community and in the way of Jesus Christ's love for all people. You know, the reason this passage comes in Easter tide is because Jesus came back from the dead to say that I am alive. And if you remain in me, if you are a follower of the way, if you are connected to the vine, then you're going to grow. And all things will be possible for you when you are strengthened by Christ who is our Lord. So whatever season you're in today, may you abide in Christ. May you surrender yourself to whatever pruning is happening in your life. And may you continue to grow as a vine toward the light. May you endure the dry season and the spring storms and know that it all contributes ultimately to fruitfulness in your life, in your family, and in our church as you walk faithfully together as a peculiar people. We ought to be a peculiar people, we followers of Jesus. We followers of the way of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Our hymn of response is one of my favorites. It's blessed be the tie that binds, a hymn that I think helps us identify with the struggles of life, but one that calls us to celebrate the unity and the hope that we have as a people who are all tangled up in this mess of a world together, but who are rooted in the life and love of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Today, if you have prayer needs, I'll be here to meet you down front as we lift our voices in song. Perhaps you've been thinking about joining this church for a long time and, uh, and, and anchoring roots right here with us at the First Baptist Church of Elkin. At this time, I invite you to make that known to us if that is your heart's, your heart's desire. May we stand together and lift our voices in song. Hymn 387. Amen. We thank you today for your presence in this time of worship. Uh, this is the, the fifth Sunday of, of Easter Tide, and some time ago I was with a group of clergy a few weeks ago, and they were talking about how the Sunday after Easter is, is universally low attendance Sunday, and I told them, not in Elkin. I said, it's later in April. It is uh, Merle Fest Sunday, which is, uh, <laughs> which is a national and North Carolina holiday, but a uh, number of folks uh, reached out today and said, not going to be there, Pastor. You know it's, it's, it's Merle Fest weekend, so let's, let's wave to those folks who I know are going to be, yeah, turn around. The camera's right there, everybody. You can look and say, 
Uh, hope you're having fun at Merle Fest. No, but I do want to thank our AV team uh, because when you can't be here, uh, you can always tune in to Facebook, and we have just an excellent broadcast. They do such a great job, and you don't see them up there, but they work hard. And so maybe every week we should, uh, we should all turn around and give a good wave to our folks, uh, not all of whom are at Merle Fest, many of whom just physically, just physically can't be here with us, but they rely they rely on that camera up there in this team to, to get the good word to them and, and connect with us each week. We're all connected to the vine, right, even through, even through the Internet sometimes, so we're grateful. we're grateful for that. If you're our guest today, hope to meet you when we go outside here in just a few minutes. May the Lord bless you all this week. May you bow together, and I'll offer you this, this benediction. May we go now as a people, all tangled up in this diverse and dynamic world, yet always drawn to the light of Jesus. Let us go forth today as the church to bear fruit fruit that will last, fruit that will make our joy complete. So go now, church, as a peculiar people, the people of the way, the way of love, the way of life, the way of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior now and always. Amen.